This is the story of a land and of a people. It was in the year 1945, the sixth year of the war, when the wheels of justice at last ground down the enemy of free mankind. The destruction and devastation which this Satan had brought to other countries now overtook his own. Victorious armies of the Allies reached those indescribable hells, the concentration camps. They found there only the remnants of humanity, most of them Jews, the few who had survived from among the murdered millions. Among their liberators were men of their own race, some in detachments of the Jewish Brigade from Palestine. But you must think of what you want to do once you're out of this place. I want to change this stick for a rifle. Well, well, but where are you from? Where's your family? I have no family. I have no home. For all of us without a home, wanderers for 2,000 years. I'm not a wanderer anymore. I've returned home. Palestine's my home. And do you think you will be able to gather us all under your roof? We're building all the time and we haven't forgotten you. I was on leave there not so long ago. Is there any feeling in the world like coming home? Seeing the fields among which you were born, the people, the work? Hello, boys! I missed my closest friends. It seemed that they'd all gone up to the hills to build a new settlement. And my wife too. Because you see, it's the custom for our young people to move on in groups to make the new settlements. Oh, good old places. place where I made my first observations on life and on my fellows. Ours was a communal settlement. Oh, sorry. And in my school days, the trees made the best gymnasium any boy could wish for. house where I lived with my parents. The cypress trees that always grew so much taller than I did every year, though we were the same age. And here, I first kissed Ruth. And this little domain, where my mother is the queen. And father, as usual, with his hundred horsepower. So at sunrise, I set out for the new home I'd never seen. 
How peaceful and happy the old village looks. How precious to us that little stream is. Like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. Before me, the earth was lying derelict, waiting for people to bring it to life. We must build a finer village even than my father's, with a big grain elevator like the one at Ashdodyakov. A fine dairy, like the one at Daganya. A beautiful dining hall that is near David. Even perhaps a pergola. And finest of all, a water tower. Water. Water. Hey, look out! Jacob, you old dog. But what? What's that water barrel doing there? Oh, of course, Jacob always has secrets. Here in the mountains, they had dug and dug without finding water. So there was nothing for it but to build a reservoir to hold the water for drinking and irrigation. I needed that dash of cold water. My head in the clouds. They've had to keep their feet on good solid earth. <laughs> so much for my grain elevator, my water tower. All the same, this is home. But what's happening here? Someone coming? Who's this girl decorating my house for? Is it in my honor? I'd come at the right time. It was for my son. And I suppose I received the news in just about as dignified a way as most fathers. And so, I was preparing a welcome for my son and his mother coming home. They were shouting for me. For me! say what was in my heart. Our land, wide expanse of stony fields. Long ago it flowed with milk and honey, but time fell the trees, and so rain, sweeping through the valleys, carried away the rich top earth. So now we had to tear out the stones and tame again the wild soil. we build terraces on the mountainside to keep the rain from washing the soil away. And one day, trees will flourish here again and there will be moisture in our land. But don't think a farmer's life is without its lighter moments.
now's a good time for a young citizen to be introduced to his fellow men. Yes, our life is good, I thought. When suddenly... Involuntarily, I turn my eyes on the Hule Valley. Nobody comes from the Hule Valley without a reason. swamps, infested by the dread malaria-spreading mosquito. But men live there settlers who are determined to stamp out the malaria, to drain the land and to make it flourish. They must continue to dig the long canals to carry away the water. But the malaria sapped their strength. Still they held to their task so many fell victim, they were forced to ask our help. was to complete the canals before the coming rains could destroy them. Another man less for the tea. But we finished our task. This is not the work of one generation. Oh yes, today they're having fun. But tomorrow it will be their job. my leave came to an end and I went back to the line knowing as I fought beside the freedom loving nations that it was to defend my country and my home. Yes, you have something to live for. All I have left is the ashes, there in the furnace, and here, 
Even my little girl, whom I managed to hide for so long, she disappeared too. They took her away when we came here. You mustn't give up hope. So many children are being found. I have a letter here. It's from my class. I'm a teacher. It's about some of the children who came to Palestine looking for their near ones. And they found them. This year we had a lot of rain at our settlement and all the crops came on wonderfully, especially in the vineyards and orchards. And we were all very glad, all of us, big and small. happened in our school. Well, to celebrate this wonderfully fruitful year, all the children of the settlements round about decided to hold a harvest festival and to have community dances. Refugee children came. We'd heard about these children from the European ghettos and concentration camps. How they'd wandered without food, torn away from their parents, and we'd been expecting them. We wanted to help them. But something happened that we couldn't understand at all. And one little girl was just like a wild kitten. But there were more surprises to come. In the dining hall, for instance. Oh, yes, they were quite ready to come and eat. Someone's taken my toothbrush. Hey, who feeds my soap? thought our life was going on in its ordinary way. Who'd seen us playing and having fun. But somehow, for instance, we called this little kitten of ours Tamar. We were really quite glad to have her in our room, although you could hardly call her sociable. She sulked by herself, but the worst thing was she never smiled. if she didn't hide them in bed with her. This strange whispering of hers, night after night, One 
day, the day of our weekly cleaning, I happened to be monitor. All the children had put their bedding out to air. Of course, Tamar may have forgotten. Well, so this is where our things got to. Hey, boys, come in. Girls. My goodness, it's a fine collection, isn't it? What does she want that for? <laughs> <laughs> She was like a wild kitten. Oh, our kitten has sharp claws. And she was so afraid of what she had done. We didn't come back by evening. We went out to look for her. We knew our forest well. It had grown up with us. After all, our parents had planted it. But it was still a strange place to Tamar. I suppose she was afraid she'd be punished. Hey! Hey! What's that? That's the sandal she was holding. Yes, the one she clubbed you with. She can't be far from here. She must be somewhere here. Where? Look! Look! Tamar! Tamar. wanted was to explain to her that nobody gets punished here. If one of us does something he shouldn't, we all of us talk the matter over and tell the guilty person what she's done wrong. Now listen, Tamar. There is no need to be afraid of us. But she doesn't understand what you're saying. <laughs> of course, I'd forgotten she doesn't understand Hebrew yet. This was a tough nut to crack. But we found the way out in Rami's pocket. He was the only one who remembered Tamar hadn't eaten since morning. Now don't scratch, Kitty. So we took Tamar home in triumph. Oh, don't be afraid, Tamar. You're going to understand us from now on. And so Tamar started to learn our way of life. First of all, the storeroom. No need to hoard your clothes. Here's where you get all you want. And here, all you need for lessons. Every year we elect committees to run our life. The works committee, for example, allots the farm work. Every three months it changes the shift, so we all get a chance to learn everything. Those who've been working in the kitchen, or serving at table. Or perhaps next learn to make a table. Those who've looked after the chickens will make carpets or spin and weave cloth for our clothes. Those who follow the plough and reap their harvest, may next find themselves in the smithy. Those who learn to build a roof over their heads, also learn how irrigation is important for the garden, and for the inner man as well. Those who drive a tractor must also care for sheep. But it's 
usual to begin with the goats. And that's where Tamar began. In the mornings, Tamar, you must learn our language. Oh, I know, beginning's the hardest part. You'll want to join us at geography, to know that though Palestine's a small country, it's very dear to us. And anatomy teaches us how the heart pumps blood through the body. But if the heart is only a pump, there will be more monuments like this to the fallen of the ghettos and concentration camps of Europe, to the millions of our brothers and sisters who have died. But the heart is not just a pump, it is a fountain of love, washing away hate and prejudice and leaving only the best in man. And therefore, one night we gathered together and whereas there are children homeless in Europe, we have resolved from this day forth to give up all our sweets and to spend our spare time picking the fruit in our gardens so that we may start a fund to bring these children to us and give them peace. And we shall be to them the brothers and sisters they have lost. Then came the moment of silence. I shall never forget that moment as long as I live. From that day, Tamar changed completely. She threw herself heart and soul into helping our appeal. Like a butterfly, she spread her wings, and she began more and more to take part in everything we did. But all these things interfered sadly with our rehearsals. Stop, stop, it's wrong. No, no, you are all mixed up. Poor Sarah, the producer, was in a fine state. And Nira, of course, always knows better than everybody else. But look, look! Tamar. But the most wonderful thing was that Tamar really laughed. Yes, she burst out laughing for the first time. And so the day of the harvest festival came, and all the children flocked to it from the neighboring villages. which used to be the wild kitten among us? No, because all our hearts beat together in the same rhythm.
<laughs> yes. But a child can start a new life again easily. I haven't the strength to begin again. Everything is finished. That's where you're wrong. I thought like you once. When I first came to Palestine, I was a human wreck, just like you. I wandered up and down the country looking for something to cling to. Then I came upon the Jordan, our ancient river, and he taught me. Yes, the river taught me that there is no end. Life can rise even from the pit. It springs again even from the ashes. From the earth comes a source of life. This is where the river is born, just like a human being. He's playful as a child. He leaps and skips about, throwing out his arms. He leads an innocent childhood like the simple folk who live on his banks. But the time comes when this stormy youngster must for the first time be taught restraint, like any child. His first meeting with civilization is at Daphne, where settlers have filled in some of his dreams came man, bringing a plan to use the soil to the full. The settlers who live on his banks drain the marshes. And so he is made to serve the next stage of civilization, agriculture. After sunset, the struggle between man and river still goes on. Under sheltering nets, man hides from the deadly mosquito. But the exuberance and caprice of the river hinder his growing up. First time at the Hula Lake, he gathers together his waters proudly like a youngster thrusting out his chest. Here sprawls the settlement of Hulata. To mastery over land, pioneers have added mastery over water with the planning of their fisheries. The crisis of his childhood is passing. His vigorous youth is about to begin. It is here that the Jordan drops below sea level, blowing faster in his course. Young Jordan reveals his strength as he forces his way through the rocks of basalt.
How wonderful is the full flower of youth, the vigor and beauty of early manhood. There are moments of meditation on bygone glory. Capernaum, symbol of things spiritual. Memories of an ancient civilization, Tiberius. glimpse of maturity in the toil of today's pioneers. And over all rests the blessing of the fruitful earth. The river enters his course again, a course of reality. He has grown bigger and broader into full maturity, and his waters serve the far-off fields. Yarmouk on his way, the Jordan enters into partnership with man, joining a great Jewish enterprise. Like a man bracing himself for action, the Jordan gathers his strength to perform the greatest task of his life. From here, the waters are led into huge turbines to be converted into electric power. The great heart of the Jordan. Naharai. Light and power created by this supreme effort of the river course through all embracing arteries far and wide. With the strength of his arms, the Jordan has borne up the country's industry. Industry, which at a crucial moment made its contribution to the cause of the Allies. The Jordan sends greetings to far-off towns. After giving up so much of his strength, the Jordan still flows on with dignity, cutting into the ancient valley of Beth Shan. His fruits, however, are still rich and abundant. But at last comes the fullness of age. Slowing pace and furrows. The end is in sight, the sea of death. Earth and sky pay their last homage.
passes into a wide expanse of nothingness. His bequest, the precious salts accumulated over millions of years, are processed into valuable chemical products. And now onwards, there stretches only death, the desert, the desert of Negev. Can we overcome death? Can we prolong life? determined to wrest this land from the jaws of death. Deeper and deeper we bite through the parched crust in our search for the source of life, water. waste of desert, we are driving the roots of a new life. And there, where a short while ago only wind moaned over the desolation, a mirage has appeared. The plowman goes out to his furrow, and from the sand, villages spring up. For all this, we need water. Every drop is precious. We collect it from our kitchens. Clean or dirty, water is water. We get it from waste. With water, the desert can breathe. And therefore the borer drills far down into the earth. We build dams to hold the rain which falls once only in the year when the storm hurls through the desert. which we capture from earth and sky, we send to our fields so that the dry soil may drink. And the good earth shows her gratitude. The desert jealously defends herself. waters of the Jordan will be brought here and life will rise again from the waste. Life will spring even from the ashes. But we must have a passionate will. We must have the strength that endures. But in the meantime, the borer plunges 
plunges deeper, plunges deeper, deeper, deeper. You have so much strength. I can't, I can't begin again alone. Look, take me with you, with you. Together with you, perhaps I can start again. Hi, Corporal, have to go now. Yes, sir. Come on, boys. Well, well, I want to change this for that. It doesn't matter where you wear it. It's how you look at it that matters. Think of it not as a badge of shame, but as a badge of pride. And you'll have the strength to start again. We'll meet again someday. Shadow. Shalom. deliver them out of all places whither they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. I myself will feed my sheep and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God.